All right. So this is this is the uh, the point at which uh, I promised that we would get down into the details in careful chronological order. Uh, you were, you, you've had pieces of this, some of them anyway. Uh, and last Tuesday, I know it was kind of a drink out of the fire hose. Uh, I kind of went through the, the kind of one mile wide, one foot deep, uh, kind of at an accelerated level. Uh, uh, I would tell you a joke that it's like at a, a 45, we played it like a 45, uh, it's a 33 album, but only the seniors understand that. Uh, so, so we went, we went through it fairly rapidly on Tuesday, but what I want to do is I want to slow down and take it step by step uh, about who killed uh, President Kennedy and why. What, what I've done is I've, I've divided the entire subject matter, which is extraordinary and, and expansive, into some 30 or so specific sub-issues of fact. Uh, and I've attached a particular degree of probability to each one of these things uh, ha as having happened in fact, generating the conclusion uh, that the, the ultimate authors uh, of the assassination of President Kennedy uh, were, were not, number one, Lee Harvey Oswald was not the principal author of this assassination, thereby making it clear that I don't believe he was the individual lone gunman that killed the president. But secondly, that the ultimate authors of this were not, in fact, uh, and that, that, of course, is what the thesis is that's been maintained by the Dallas Police Department, the FBI, the Warren Commission, uh, virtually all of the major media, uh, from the New York Times to CBS, Dan Rather, and uh, explicated in great detail by Vincent Buglosi and, uh, and Gerald Posner, that that whole premise that he was the sole author of this assassination, uh, I don't agree with at all, uh, for reasons that we've discussed. Uh, secondly, I don't believe that it was the communists, uh, either uh, A, uh, Fidel Castro and the revolutionary government of Cuba, uh, as was insisted upon by Johnny Roselli and John Martino and others that were communicating with Jack Anderson in his column in Washington, uh, and uh, was pushed very hard by extreme right wingers, the Minuteman and others, uh, and other right wing organizations, primarily from the South, insisting that this had been the communists. Uh, uh, the Castro regime, that we ought to retaliate against them. And nor do I believe it was the Soviet Union, uh, which was very heavily pushed uh, by uh, the Mexico station of the CIA with uh, David Atlee Phillips and some others that were there, uh, including uh, 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 William Sullivan, who was the uh, South American, Latin American uh, Special Intelligence Service for the FBI that I don't believe it was either Castro or the Soviet Union were the authors of this. Nor do I believe that the mob uh, is the one that did this, as was settled upon primarily by the House Select Committee on Assassinations and uh, G. Robert Blakey, the general counsel, in his book that he published uh, called The Plot Against, uh, The Plot to Kill the President. I don't believe that that's true. I don't believe that it was, uh, it was uh, uh, Carlos Marcello, the, of the mob boss of New Orleans simply because he didn't want to get deported, which I'm sure he didn't uh, want to get deported. And I don't believe that it was Santos Traficante specifically to reopen the heroin trafficking in the casinos and uh, the houses of prostitution and stuff that they were running in Havana. Uh, and I don't believe that it was Sam Giancana uh, and, uh, and uh, also Jimmy Hoffa simply to retaliate against uh, John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy for this major campaign that they engaged in against organized crime. I don't believe any of those things are true. Uh, and I don't believe that, that when, uh, when John Morgano asserted that, that Traficante had made this confession to him on his deathbed, uh, that that's true at all. And if you knew John Morgano, you'd know it wasn't. Uh, and fourthly, I don't believe that it was the S-Force functioning all by itself. That is this 15-man uh, unit of uh, exiled uh, Cuban refugees in Miami, uh, any of the groups, Alpha 66, 2506 Brigade, any of them, 
I don't believe that the 15 of those guys who were selected by Traffic County back in 1960 to serve on this S force to assassinate Castro, I don't believe that they by themselves made a decision to turn around 180 degrees and kill the president uh, because of his having betrayed them. Uh, his having burnt out two of their bases, as you'll all recall, the one on No Name Key and the one in the Everglades. I don't believe that they, they would have had the capacity by themselves to do all of the things that were done uh, regarding the planning and the cover-up of this. They would have been caught if they had tried to do that. Uh, so, and, and I don't believe that it was just a rogue element within the Central Intelligence Agency, a handful of the more extreme uh, people in the CIA who had, in effect, gone native uh, with the Cuban exiles and had become outraged at the betrayal of the Cuban exile community. Uh, I don't believe it was just uh, Frank Sturgis and E. Howard Hunt uh, and David Atlee Phillips and uh, David uh, uh, Sanchez Morales. I don't believe that that's all that it was at all. Uh, nor do I believe, sixthly, that it was the CIA as an institution. Uh, that whole uh, ogre that was threatened, uh, that everyone wrote, wrote about back in 1947 with the creation of the National Security Act of 1947 that created the CIA, watching out to say, look, at, you can't have a political secret espionage group like this functioning in the country because they'll eventually turn around and overthrow your government. That I don't believe that this was uh, the CIA as an institution, even working with the Joint Special Operations Agency, the uh, agency inside the Pentagon that Fletcher uh, Prouty talks about in the secret team. Uh, it's not that they weren't capable of doing something like this, it's just that they weren't capable of effectuating all of the things that happened with the cover-up and coordinating at that, uh, that high a level. So, uh, and finally, uh, I don't uh, agree with, uh, with Peter Dale Scott, <laughs> Professor Scott from Berkeley, who basically concluded correctly, I think, strategically, that there had to be some uh, entity, some kind of group of people uh, above all of these groups that would, would have had to have authorized an action like this, or else the people who had participated in it would have been caught. Uh, there has to be some element uh, as he pointed out strategically, that authorized this assassination that has kept it from being revealed. That it would have been so odious and so unacceptable for people to find out about this, that there was some entity or group of people that was above this, that was upstairs. Uh, but I agree with his, his strategic conclusion that that had to be true, uh, but, and, and I, believe, I agree with his tactical decision that we had to ask the question as to who was it that would have been ultimately responsible for deciding whether or not an assassination of this type of seriousness could have been carried out without the people being punished for having done it. Uh, so I agree with him both strategically and tactically, but I don't agree with him logistically that he came to the conclusion that that entity, that group of people that had ultimately sanctioned and authorized and green-lighted this assassination would have been the intelligence community sanctioned international narcotics trafficking network. I don't believe that they themselves would have been able to get away with this. Uh, in fact, uh, what I do believe that instead that the ultimate authors of the assassination were a group that was uh, headed up operationally by Alan Dulles. Uh, and it wasn't Alan Dulles in his capacity as the just recently fired and therefore disgruntled uh, director of the Central Intelligence Agency who wanted to protect the Central Intelligence Agency as an institution from being splintered into a thousand pieces and scattered to the winds, uh, as was reported uh, by Arthur Schlesinger Jr. that what Kennedy intended to do to them. I don't believe that it was in that capacity that Alan Dulles uh, headed up this operation to assassinate the president, but instead it was Alan Dulles functioning as the consigliere, uh, the wartime uh, counsel, legal counsel, for a, a very shadowy network, <coughs> uh, a shadowy private intelligence company 
that was organized, uh, made up of former low-level and mid-level former military intelligence operatives uh, that was uh, funded by an extremely conservative group of American businessmen, including William D. Pauley, uh, Clint Murchison, Sr., uh, H.L. Hunt, uh, another important individual that financed this, but which organization, this shadowy private intelligence activity organization, that this covert operation uh, group was in fact uh, organized by uh, retired U.S. Army General uh, Charles A. Willoughby, uh, the former G2, the uh, head of military intelligence for General Douglas MacArthur in the Pacific during World War II. Uh, this uh, General Willoughby, uh, whose real name is in fact uh, Adolf uh, Wiedenbach, uh, a, an extremely reactionary fascist uh, from Germany uh, who served as General MacArthur's uh, personal Nazi, as he liked to refer to him, uh, his, his little personal fascist that functioned as his group. And what, what this group is, is this shadowy private intelligence activity. Now, when they use this term private intelligence activity, they're not talking just about gathering intelligence and information or analyzing the information and providing it to people as a matter of intelligence. When they're referring to themselves as an intelligence organization, they're talking about an organization that has the capacity to engage in active covert operations, uh, active efforts like the OSS engaged in of assassinating people, overthrowing governments, uh, destroying people's reputations, blackmailing people, extorting uh, other things. Uh, that's what they refer to when they're referring to a shadowy intelligence network, a private network of these former low-level and mid-level uh, military intelligence operatives that uh, were gathered together by General Willoughby. That General Willoughby gathered these people together uh, in 1951. Uh, when the uh, when President Truman, uh, 1951, fired uh, uh, Douglas MacArthur as the commanding officer in the, in the, the general uh, general of the army, who was the commander of all uh, forces, Allied forces in Korea, when General MacArthur was not willing to accept the directives of the president to basically stand down and allow a a uh, treaty to be established, a, not, not a treaty, but a, a peace uh, agreement, so that they would not, that they would end up having a peace uh, stand down from the Korean War, uh, and MacArthur wanted to use nuclear weapons uh, to actually bomb the, the Chinese and to set up a radiation wall to protect uh, the Korean Peninsula against invasion from China. And there was a huge confrontation went down uh, between the civilian authority of the president and General MacArthur, uh, insisting upon this kind of rabid, extreme position that he had. And, uh, and uh, Truman, to the amazement of everyone, fired MacArthur in 1951. And MacArthur was then brought back home. Uh, and he was, he, he was financed in his return home by uh, Clint Murchison, uh, and H.L. Hunt in Dallas, Texas, uh, for a, a return, uh, triumphant return into the United States in Dallas with a, a large parade and a, and a welcome home, a hero ceremony. Uh, uh, and, in fact, uh, General MacArthur brought with him General Willoughby, who was his chief of intelligence, who came with him at that time. And uh, Clint Murchison and H.L. Hunt and this fellow by the name of William D. Pauley uh, basically opened up a, a MacArthur for President office in Chicago uh, and were planning to run MacArthur for the presidency uh, in 1952 uh, instead of Eisenhower. And they, 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 this, uh, this whole group around MacArthur were much more conservative, indeed reactionary, uh, than was Eisenhower himself. And this private, shadowy network of covert operations specialists and low-level intelligence 
uh, operatives from the military were organized together by General Willoughby under the rubric of a thing called the Foreign Intelligence Digest Network. Uh, and we encountered groups like this when we were doing the Iran-Contra investigation and when we were doing the Karen Sokwood investigation. We discovered that there was a group conducting surveillance against the people we were working with called Intelligence Digest. And it was a very aggressive covert operations, intelligence gathering operation that actually engaged in dirty tricks like COINTELPRO and other things against uh, peace groups and environmental groups and feminist groups, etc. This is something very similar to what we discovered, this Foreign Intelligence Digest Network that was organized by General Willoughby uh, back in 1951. And they worked for uh, what it became known as is a, a very conservative, <coughs> specific group of very wealthy American businessmen, industrialists, and financiers. Uh, and that's all that you'll ever hear about it, what little you ever do hear about that organization. But the fact of the matter is it was recognized and is reported often that that group of businessmen included somehow the Rockefellers, uh, which means John D. Rockefeller and then later David Rockefeller. Uh, the owners of Standard Oil of New Jersey, Standard Oil of California, the uh, Chase Manhattan Bank, uh, founders of the Council on Foreign Relations, etc. But the fact of the matter is, this particular group uh, included a lot more than just they. It, 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 also, it also included uh, E.H. Harriman, uh, the, the owner of massive amounts of, uh, of uh, railways and, and powerful corporations, etc. Uh, uh, and therefore, Averill Harriman, his son, uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, the head of the Morgan Guarantee Trust, uh, also uh, Irene DuPont, the major DuPont family, uh, the DuPont Chemical Corporation, Henry Luce, uh, the owner of Life Magazine uh, and the Time Magazine, uh, the CEO of this particular group. It turns out this group all ended up being private clients of Brown Brothers Harriman, a major private financial investment group on Wall Street. And that this is where they met and they organized and they talked and shared ideas with each other. They coordinated with each other. Uh, and in fact, they were all represented by the law firm of Sullivan and Cromwell, uh, the senior partners of which who represented Brown Brothers, Harriman, and represented these extraordinarily wealthy industrialists, each in their individual capacity, uh, in Sullivan and Cromwell, was John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles. Uh, in terms of in, in John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles become very critical in this group, this private group of wealthy businessmen, because Alan Dulles began to function as what I've termed this consulary. It was a wartime uh, council for them that would actually engage in coordinating the secret activities of this covert, shadowy intelligence network that they had functioning for them inside the Foreign <coughs> Intelligence Digest network. And that this uh, John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles, it's important to remember that, uh, that these were the grandsons of John W. Foster. And John W. Foster was the Secretary of State back in the 1890s when there was this huge surge of imperialism on the part of the United States government where we ended up taking over, the, taking over uh, Hawaii, taking over the Philippines, uh, expanding out and uh, in, in going after Cuba. Cuba, very importantly, because as you know, Cuba plays a very major role in this issue of the assassination of President Kennedy in 1963. This is the group of people that John W. Foster and his people uh, under Benjamin Harriman back in the 1890s that were actively engaged in this unique period of American history. It was the peak, the, the, the crescendo of the robber barons of that entire period from 1868 up to 1900. There was this whole uh, ethos in the, in the United States of these, uh, these major industrialists and financiers who had basically capitalized upon the creation of corporations 
here in the United States, a, a new business entity as of 1868 that was able to protect the owners of the industry or of the assets of a company to protect them totally against any liability uh, for whatever the company did, even though they owned the company. Uh, and the management, the boards of directors and the management were all completely immunized under this theory of corporate uh, identity. Uh, and these, these robber barons had risen from 1868 to 1898 into a point of absolute domination and control of the United States government and their foreign policies. And they were instrumental in generating this type of expansionist attitude on the part of the government structures, affecting the members of the Senate and the Congress and the executive branch uh, to engage in this kind of aggressive imperialist activity to acquire access, privileged access, specially privileged access to the strategic raw materials that these people deem to be necessary for the empowerment of the United States as a major imperial force in the world, uh, to say nothing about enriching them personally. Uh, and that, that, but it's extremely important to remember that these people had gotten to the point where just more money wasn't all that they were after. What they were after was dominion and control, that they needed to have more resources, more power, they wanted to have the United States become an imperial power to be able to compete with the historical likes of, the, of England and Portugal and Spain in the previous history. They wanted the United States to be able to dominate not only all of Latin America, but they wanted to have the United States to be able to reach out into the Pacific and dominate the Pacific to take over not only the Philippines and Hawaii, but further out into Japan and into Asia. They, that Asia was a very major objective for these people. Uh, and that's, they, a lot of them became known by the nickname as the China Lobby, that they were this in, group that saw the entire future of the imperial power of the United States as reaching into and dominating the resources of, of China and Asia. And that, uh, so that this, this relationship between John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles to their grandfather, John W. Foster, who was there as the Secretary of State during that period, uh, is extremely important because their grandfather, John W. Foster, basically indoctrinated them both, uh, the John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles, both of them, that this was the proper role for the United States and that there was this special relationship between the industrialists and the bankers and the financiers uh, the, and their lawyers to be able to make the policy decisions for the United States. That, in, in fact, as I mentioned in passing to you, uh, John W. Foster's son-in-law, uh, Robert Lansing, who married John W. Foster's oldest daughter, in fact became the Secretary of State under Wilson during World War I. And in fact, at the end of World War I, uh, Lansing invited his two nephews, John W. Foster and Alan Foster, to come with him to attend the Treaty of Versailles at the end of World War I. And what happened is that these two young lawyers were assigned by Robert Lansing, their uncle, to actually draft up the reparations agreements that were designed at the Treaty of Versailles that insisted upon the government of Germany repaying billions of dollars of reparations costs to uh, companies and business people in the West for the damage that they had inflicted in mounting an aggressive war in World War I. So John W. So John W. Foster's two grandsons, Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles, the nephews of Lansing, actually drafted up the reparations agreements at the end of World War I and got appointed by Robert Lansing to be the lawyers for Germany at the end of World War I. And so they are the ones that actually then crafted the loan agreements that went right straight back to the members of Brown Brothers Harriman. That the clients in Brown Brothers Harriman, these people that I've listed for you, these were the people that were in fact at one and the same time, many of them being paid back for damage that had been done to their various business interests throughout World War I. And they were the ones that were loaning the money to Germany to actually pay themselves back. Uh, and the lawyers for both sides of this deal were 
were uh, John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles, all working for the same on both sides of this issue. And so that's an extraordinarily important role that they played in this group of people uh, between, between the end of 19, uh, in, in 1917, at the end of World War I, these people who had gotten used to ba basically calling the shots for American foreign policy and this whole age of imperialism and the robber barons actually continued this process that they in fact had generated a foreign military expeditionary force in 1904 to go down into South America, into Nicaragua, and basically overthrow the democratically elected government down in Nicaragua and put into power Anastasio Somoza back in 1904, and then later on overthrew and took control over Panama and Guatemala and other places down there for United Fruit, which was a, an investment client of Brown Brothers Harriman, yeah. the lawyers for which was John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles, lawyering for the United Fruit Corporation. So this, this, this group of people uh, the lawyers for whom were Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles uh, was a, a center of power in the United States uh, and in fact at the end of World War I uh, they actively, actively participated in having these loans all negotiated and so at the very end of World War I this same group of clients for Brown Brothers Harriman succeeded in generating a foreign military expeditionary force to go into Russia to actually attempt to quell the revolution, the Bolshevik revolution, that had, uh, had ousted the Tsar in 1917, and this foreign military expeditionary force, which very few of you have probably ever even heard about, was sent into Russia and formed an alliance with the white Russians, the pro-Tsarist Russians in western uh, Russia around St. Petersburg. This, this, this whole group of people were extremely royalist in their viewpoints of supporting the, the czar, supporting an elite uh, ruling oligarchy, uh, and disagreed entirely with any type of more egalitarian or democratic process. As it turns out, this very same tradition has existed inside the United States ever since our founding. When the, when the basic founders of the American Constitution, of uh, James Madison and, and uh, Jefferson and Aaron Burr and the others, that were in favor of the natural law worldview that was inculcated in the Constitution of the United States, <coughs> stating that every individual was completely equal to others and had a whole set of uh, inalienable rights, that they had a right to, to be protected uh, by the government. Uh, there was a whole group of people, Alexander Hamilton and the Federalists, a lot of them that in fact totally disagreed with this, and Alexander Hamilton was the consulary for that group. That whole group of financiers and business people and people back in the, at the founding of the Constitution, they, they always have a lawyer. It's important for you to remember that when you're thinking of going to law school. Uh, you, have, you have to start thinking about who your clients are going to be. And this, this, this has existed inside the United States. There's been this alliance between these financiers and industrialists and their lawyers who create things like the corporation. Uh, and the instruments of stock in the corporations that become financial instruments that can then be used by the financiers and the bankers. So this is the group that we're talking about here. And that what we discover is at the end of World War I in 1917, Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles played this absolutely central, pivotal role in generating the reparations for Germany and negotiating the loan contracts that came right back to their clients. So that they, they had this central role that they played. And what happened is during the, the reconstruction of Germany from the end of World War II, uh, World War I in 1917, all the way up to 1924, this loan arrangement that was going on was in fact financing the resuscitation of Germany. And what happened in 1924 is that the CEO of Brown Brothers Harriman, this group of financiers and their lawyers, the, the CEO of that group was a guy named George Herbert Walker. Uh, and George Herbert Walker uh, stepped out as the CEO, turned over the CEO position in Brown Brothers Harriman to his son-in-law, Prescott Bush, who was the father of George Herbert Walker Bush and the grandfather of George W. Bush. 
that uh, these are these are the people that were doing this. And George Herbert Walker stepped out as the CEO of Brown Brothers Harriman in 1924 and created a bank called the Union Bank of New York. And these financiers that were the, the private financial clients of Brown Brothers Harriman began to deposit millions and millions of dollars into the Union Bank of New York. And the Union Bank of New York set up a subsidiary, a foreign subsidiary in the Netherlands uh, that was called the, uh, the Bank Voorhandel and Shira, that was in fact the, the, uh, the bank in the Netherlands, which is called the, the Bank of, of Commerce and Shipping. And this was run by a fellow by the, by the name of Fritz Theismann. Theismann. Theismann is the guy that ran the bank for them, and it was, it was proven now by this institute in uh, the Netherlands, the Institute of, uh, for Social Gerschenstein. They have proven that the financial backing for the creation of the Third Reich in Germany was coming from this bank. That these are the, this is the finances were going in through the Union Bank of New York from the Brown Brothers Harriman people, clients, to this bank in the Netherlands, financing the rise of Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich in Germany between World War I and World War II to create a bulwark against Bolshevism in Europe. Uh, and that's, that's who this group is. And this is the group for whom this shadowy network of, of former intelligence operatives, military intelligence operatives, were working. And they were funded not just by these private wealthy individuals like H.L. Hunt and Clint Richardson Sr. and uh, this guy William Pauley. They were also secretly funded uh, later on, at the end of World War II, uh, by this extraordinary uh, trove of treasure that I pointed out to you. That when we, when we get all the way from World War I into World War II, in the beginning of World War II, with the rise of the Third Reich and the Nazis uh, attempting to basically assert fascist control over all of Europe, and then attempt to assert fascist control back into Russia with the invasion of Russia by Germany, uh, all of that activity was going on, and remember, the United States was standing by, doing nothing. That the, the, the German army had invaded France and was marching down the Champs Elysees. They, in fact, were firebombing all of England, and the United States was doing nothing, basically, uh, because of the power of this group. This group was pushing back and prohibiting anybody in the government from supporting uh, the, the effort to go to war against Germany to stop them from doing what they were doing in Europe. And they were attempting to stop the, uh, the allies of Japan into, into uh, China. Uh, except that there was an element of this group that while they were favoring the fascists in Germany and in the Third Reich, were getting quite upset about the fact that Japan was attempting to send forces into China. And so they began, they formed another private expeditionary operation, uh, which, was, which was called the, the Flying Tigers. And they actually began to secretly ship weapons to the forces in China to oppose the Japanese. So you got this whole opening at the, prior to World War II, prior to the United States going into World War II. Well, there was on the one hand a whole group of very progressive liberals and, 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 and progressive people that went in to try to fight the Nazis by going in the Lincoln Brigade and going into Spain and fighting against the fascists uh, uh, in Spain. Uh, the, there was this extreme right-wing group functioning out of Brown Brothers Harriman under, under uh, Henry Luce and under, uh, under uh, um, William D. Pauley that went, into, that went into China to start building up private forces against the Japanese at that time. And so, so now you get up to World War II, all of World War II goes down, uh, and eventually the Franklin Roosevelt figures out a way, in fact, we haven't gotten into a lot of details on that, but got into a process by which he goaded the Japanese into attacking us, uh, into attacking us, that is, in Hawaii clear out into the middle of the Pacific Ocean, uh, where the Japanese uh, were finally baited into attacking us on December 7th of 1941, and that enabled the United States to go to war against Japan. It's important to remember, a lot of people don't know this, 
that the United States never declared war against Germany. They declared war against Japan because we were attacked by Japan. And then Germany declared war on us because of having attacked their ally in the Axis powers. Okay? So that what happened is World War II takes place, and we end up, as you know, in June of 1942, basically destroying the Japanese Navy at the Battle of Midway. And then six months later, uh, in February of 1943, end up the Russians end up destroying the 5th and 6th Army of Germany out in front of the gates of Stalingrad. Uh, and so from that point on, it became clear, both to the Japanese and the Germans, that the Western Allies were going to win this war. So two things began to happen at that point. Number one, the Japanese began to move massive amounts of treasure that they had stolen all the way from, 19, from 1925 all the way to 1940. They'd been raiding all through, all through Asia, stealing gold and commandeering jewelry and, and platinum and silver, everything they could get their hands on. And they were, they were commandeering this. There was a special unit of the Japanese military called the, uh, the Golden Lily under the command of General Yakushima. And they had gathered together tons of this, of this gold and silver and jewels and had brought them into Japan. But now they realized in 1943, by the end of February of 1943, that they were going to lose the war. And they realized there would come a point in time when the American forces, basically, were going to be attacking them in, in Japan. So what they did is they secretly began to move this treasure out of Japan into the Philippines, and they began to bury it. They buried it in 175 <coughs> separate troves, uh, huge deep uh, caverns they dug in, and buried the people, the, the prisoners of war that they used to dig the holes. They buried them with the treasure, 175 of these. Each one of these troves containing $100 billion worth of gold and silver and platinum and jewels. And the, at the same time, the Nazis in Germany, the th members of the Third Reich, they began organizing to say, look, it, we aren't going to win this war. What we need to do is we need to establish an alliance with the Americans to, to convince them that they're going to have to prepare now against Russia and the communists. Because we know that our allies in the United States who had prevented the United States from going to war against us are on our side. And they have this... this absolute fury against the communists because the communists are the enemies of these imperialists who want to go around the world basically gathering in control over the resources around the world and so that what the German hierarchy did is they began reaching out to the, their same allies in the United States and the allies started responding by suggesting that we have to establish an alliance with the Third Reich members as the, as the war is coming to an end to prepare for opposing Russia after the war is over. And that's what they began to do. And so what they did is they organized the whole process whereby Reinhard Galen, who was the commander of the Waffen-SS Third Reich <coughs> Anti-Soviet and Anti-Eastern Bloc Intelligence, he gathered up all of the information and documents uh, and stuff in microfilm of all of the spies that they had against the Soviet Union in the, in the Eastern Bloc. And they, they took copies of these and put them in these barrels and they, they whisked them away and they brought them up into Bavaria, into the mountains of Bavaria, and buried them in the meadow up there uh, to, to be secure, to make these available for the United States allies at the end of the war as a bargaining tool. So this particular operation started, and when the war came to, started to come to a conclusion, when, it, when we ended the war in Europe against the, the Third Reich, the, Reinhard Galen turned himself in to the 101st Counterintelligence Corps and said, here I am, I am Major General Reinhard Galen, the head of the anti-Soviet and anti-Eastern Bloc intelligence for the Third Reich. I will agree to come work for you uh, if you will take me off the Nuremberg War Tribunal list and 100 of the men I designate and let me establish an organization. I will run the intelligence uh, division for the new West German government. When you divide with Soviet Union, Germany, and you are in charge of West Germany, just make me the head of intelligence, and I have all of these resources and spies in place already, and they undertake this major operation called Operation Overcast. 
in which this alliance is established. And Reinhard Galen, with his 101st Counterintelligence Corps translator by the name of Theodore G. Shackley, uh, a, a German-born uh, naturalized American who had been part of the United States Army, uh, ended up ended up uh, being his translator, and he came with him to Fort Hunt outside of Washington, D.C., and for almost three weeks they carried on these negotiations, pursuant to which Galen was then designated to be the new head of intelligence for West Germany. And what he did is he very quickly, at the end of the war, he established a major training facility called the Anti-Communist Special Warfare Training Academy at a place called Oberammergau in the Bavarian mountains of Bavaria. And there he put in charge of that operation Major General Otto Skorzeny. Otto Skorzeny had been the head of the special forces of the SS, the people called the werewolves. He was the nastiest dude in the entire SS, this guy. Big six foot five guy with a, a Heidelberg saber scar and six league boots and uh, everything but the monocle, this guy. And he ran the academy, and he began to train members uh, of the Allied, uh, the Allies, uh, high-level intelligence officers. Again, intelligence being not only the people who gather and analyze intelligence and advise on it, but also carry out covert operations or dirty tricks. They were there were 1,200 of these men trained between 1947 and 1965 by Otto Skorzeny, and they were they were dispersed all across the world inside the high levels of the intelligence departments of the allied nations. As I pointed out to you in passing, these men, these 1,200 men, had greater loyalty to each other horizontally than they did to any one of their governments vertically. And this was a brotherhood, a brotherhood trained by Otto Skorzeny, who were fascists, not just, not just conservative, not just anti-communist, these were fascists. These were people were trained to understand the fascist ideology that believed in having this, the nation state's uh, powers of government utilized to subsidize the major corporations, to give special treatment to the corporations, to protect them and their, their owners, and to, give, and to engage in major imperialist ventures which would require major war spending so that the major industries that had steel and petroleum and other and rubber and other products that these people owned be able to be purchased for the war machinery. This, in fact, was a fascist regime that they were planning on. And the Germans planned to instigate this, this new fascist regime at the end of the war. And so what they began to do toward the end of the war is they began to ship people out, all from Germany and Europe, ship them out down into South America, down into Brazil and Argentina and Uruguay and Paraguay, and they began to nest down there. That was what their operation was. The Japanese stood and fought in the, until they were basically bombed with the, the atomic bombs uh, in August of 1945, and then they surrendered. And what happened is, is Truman, immediately after the surrender of the Japanese in August of 1945, disbanded the OSS, that special group, the Office of Special Services that had been created at, during at the beginning of World War II, in which there was a whole panoply of men who were trained in these special operations, these special covert operations, assassinations, killing, special warfare, parachuting in behind lines and doing subversive things, extraordinarily talented, aggressive people in time of war. Yeah, but they were disbanded immediately after the surrender of Japan. And what happened is the, the, these people at Brown Brothers Harriman, uh, the lawyers for which were Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles, uh, Alan Sullivan and Cromwell, they began to push and shove to insist upon having a, a, an OSS-like organization created to have a permanent state of war against Russia. <laughs> Uh, exactly what the agenda was that the Third Reich people wanted to have done, that those fascists there. And so the fascist allies of the Third Reich, the actual creators of the Third Reich, that were in Brown Brothers Harriman, uh, began to, to push and shove in power uh, their way into getting this established. And in fact, uh, one of these people, William D. Pauley, uh, was uh, assigned to a commission to study 
how, what should be done, and he specifically uh, helped write the report saying that the United States should create a standing agency that proved to be more effective and more ruthless at destroying their enemy using whatever means were necessary, even if those means were completely repugnant to the entire American philosophy, uh, and that they had to learn how to destroy their opponents even if the American people wouldn't accept that. Uh, that the American people might one day have to be told about this, but whether they were told or not, this had to take place. That was William D. Pauley in the Doolittle Commission. And at the same time, there was a commission created by, by Truman that was headed up by the man by the name of, of uh, Robert Lovett. And it turns out that Robert Lovett becomes a very important person here because, as I've told you before, at the end of World War II, after the Japanese uh, surrendered, and the OSS was disbanded, the members of the OSS were distributed out around the rest of the world into military intelligence groups. And the G2, uh, for military intelligence of the U.S. Army in Manila, in the Philippines, was a man by the name of Edward G. Lansdale. And Edward G. Lansdale, uh, at the end of the war, when General Yakushima, the fellow that I told you about, who headed up the Golden Lily operation, pilfering these billions of dollars of uh, trillions of dollars of gold and silver and platinum and jewels, brought all of the, 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 the troves to, to the Philippines. So the head of G2 in the Philippines, Edward Lansdale, decided that what he was going to do is he was going to take the surrender of Yakushima and torture his driver and torture his driver until the driver revealed to, to Lansdale where these troves were. And finally, Lansdale succeeded along with a guy by the name of Ser, Ser, uh, Severino Garcia Diaz, Santa Romana, his name was. And he was the deputy to Lansdale and actually performed the personal torture of the driver of General Yakushima <laughs> until the general coughed up, the, the driver coughed up information about where 12 of these troves were. And they made him take him to, they made him take Lansdale and uh, in Santa Romano to one of the sites and punch the site showing them how to get through the booby traps. And they verified that there was $100 billion uh, in gold and platinum and jewels buried in this trove. And they had now the designation of where the other 12 were. Now understand, this would total $1.2 trillion dollars, 1.2 trillion dollars in, in 1945, the price of gold at $32 an ounce, which is now $1,400 an ounce. And this trove, when Lansdale discovered that he had access to this trove, he flew immediately to Singapore to meet with General Douglas MacArthur, who was the, the general of the army and the commander in the Pacific uh, Theater. And he went and told him about the fact that they had discovered this $1.2 trillion in, in gold and jewels and platinum and silver. And what uh, Douglas MacArthur did is brought in his G2 to the meeting, this guy Charles Willoughby, and brought him into the meeting, and they realized what they had, and they were both flown, Lansdale and Willoughby were flown by Douglas MacArthur on his private plane all the way back to Washington, D.C. from Singapore and went in to meet with Truman and to tell him what they had. And they explained to Truman what they had discovered there. And Truman invited into the meeting after having gotten cleared through, uh, through uh, his, his chief of staff uh, that al allowed them into, into the meeting. Uh, Clark Clifford uh, invited him into the, they had the meeting and then Truman sent for his secretary of war. And I remember, this is 1945, was just at the very end of the war, they hadn't, hadn't even completed all of the, the surrender terms yet. But the, this, is, this is now December of 1945, this meeting took place. And so Truman invites into the meeting uh, his Secretary of War, Henry L. Stimson, who just happens to be a senior partner of Brown Brothers Harriman. And, and, and Stimson invites into the meeting, says, no, I have to have two other people in here. He brings in Robert D. Anderson, also a partner of Brown Brothers Harriman, an assistant secretary of war, and Robert Lovett, who is also an assistant secretary of war, and also a senior partner in Brown Brothers Harriman. 
and a third guy by the name of John J. McClure, McCloy. And so John J. McCloy and Robert Lovett and uh, Robert B. Anderson come in and sit in on this meeting with Henry Stimson, their boss at Brown Brothers Harriman. And the agreement is made that this $1.2 trillion is going to be put into a completely ultra-secret trust, private trust, not in the possession of the United States government, not under the control of the United States government, but a secret trust, which is going to be administered by the three people that were in the meeting. Robert Lovett, senior partner of Brown Brothers Harriman, Robert D. Anderson, senior partner of Brown Brothers Harriman, and John J. McCloy, an attorney. Okay, so these three men are put in charge of this trust, which is known to the insiders as the Anderson Trust, under the name of Robert B. Anderson. It's also sometimes referred to by the very few people that know of its existence as the Black Eagle Trust. That this $1.2 trillion fund is then used by these three men to actually finance the putting into office of fascists all around the world all through Europe, in Greece, in Italy, in the elections of 1948. Uh, they, buy, they buy off everyone, they suppress all of the partisans, all of the kind of more progressive forces that had fought the Nazis all through World War II. Uh, they, they crush these people with the funding from the Black, the Black Eagle Trust, from the, the, the Anderson Trust, and they put into office the fascists all around Europe and in Asia, in Japan, working with the, the fascists who had basically brought Japan into the war. And all of these people are reinstalled uh, in power because they agreed to be anti-communists. The fact of the matter is they're a lot more than just anti-communists. They are fascists, just like these people in Brown Brothers Harriman, just like Henry Luce, uh, just like uh, these, these uh, other people that I've mentioned here, uh, including William D. Pauley. These people are not normal conservatives. These people are reactionaries. They're complete fascists who believe in this theory of government, of dominating and, and gaining control of all of the instrumentalities of the nation state to be utilized for the benefit of their corporations and to foster and promote an imperial policy of reaching out around the world to lay special claim to all of the resources that are needed by these capitalists to actually bring the money into their, to bring those resources into their hands so they can be used to increase their wealth and to empower the United States uh, in a new era, a new American century, which is actually an article that was written by Henry Luce in his Life magazine, proposing that the United States follow up on and become its own, the dominating power uh, if, of the new century, of the 20th century. So this is, the, this is the group that we're, we're dealing with now. Uh, and so, so that is the first premise, uh, the first conclusion that, uh, that I have come to. And the second of the two conclusions is that Lee Harvey Oswald was in fact employed by this Foreign Intelligence Digest network. That he had, he had, uh, he was not in fact some lone, crazy, strange person. Uh, that what he really was is a young fellow who had been recruited when he was in the Marine Corps, uh, based in Japan, at the U-2 base in Japan. He in fact had discovered, as I've mentioned to you in passing, that he in fact had discovered that there were women of the evening in the various bars around the U-2 base who were making inquiries of the young men that worked there to gather intelligence information. And he reported that to his superiors, and he ended up being recruited into a program to actually be a dangle and go into the bars and, and make information available to these women because they wanted to try to track back their potential false information to, to find out who the sources were, what the network of espionage looked like that the Soviet Union had going against the U-2. And in fact, when he proved to be adequate in that particular performance. He was then recruited into a special program run by the Office of Naval Intelligence uh, that was called Operation Redskin, operating out of North Carolina. And he was specially trained there to be a dangle, to be trained in the Russian language and then sent into Russia uh, as a dangle to have the Russians be able to start providing 
information to him and him getting information to uh, give back to the Office of Naval Intelligence. And so he went to Russia simply announcing to the Marine Corps that he decided he didn't want to be in the Marine Corps anymore uh, and that his mother needed him back home. Uh, and so they said, sure, you can leave. And so he did. Uh, and within a matter of three or four days after getting back home, he ends up flying to Russia and uh, allegedly renouncing his American citizenship, spends uh, 18 months or more there, uh, doesn't prove to be extremely successful there because the Russians don't trust him, not surprisingly. Uh, and therefore, he ends up saying, I guess I want to leave. I want to come back to the United States. I want my citizenship back. And so they said, sure, fine, come on home. They bring him home. And then he's met at the, uh, at the, the ship by these extreme right-wing elements. Uh, these white, this white Russian community that were emigres from, uh, from Russia had actually left Russia at the end of World War II, their families, because they were pro-Tsarists, and they were in New Orleans and Dallas. And he ends up being befriended by all of these people, and he ends up being recruited to be an employee uh, of this Foreign Intelligence Digest network. Uh, and that, that, that I believe that what happened is he was, he was not in any way spying upon Guy Bannister and David Ferry and, uh, and the other people in New Orleans that were all basically providing military equipment to the Lake Pontchartrain uh, paramilitary base that was there of the, of the Cuban uh, exiles that were attacking the island of Cuba. He was working with them. He supported that whole activity and operation. Who he was actually spying upon was the Cuban group. The, the, the anti, uh, the pro-Castro Cuban community in New Orleans and later in Dallas. That's what he was doing. He actually went and signed up to be a member of the American Civil Liberties Union uh, to actually help spy on them. Uh, this is what he was doing. And uh, so he was one of these low-level former military intelligence operatives who had been hired by the Foreign Intelligence Digest Network to be going around gathering information against liberal and progressive groups and communist groups uh, and helping and working with the Cuban exiles uh, and their, their supporters like Guy Bannister who was the president of the Caribbean division of the World Anti-Communist League. That's who these people were. Uh, and I believe that what happened is that we've gone into some length about why it is that President Kennedy ended up being hated eventually, uh, by these people, is because the, when, the, when the Cuban Missile Crisis took place, and on that night of October 26th of 1962, when the Joint Chiefs of Staff, under the whip hand of Curl Curtis LeMay, the Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force, uh, and, but also uh, Lemonser and, uh, and Arlie Burke and the others in the Joint Chiefs, all voted to attack the island of Cuba, Despite the warnings that that could generate a major thermonuclear exchange, President Kennedy was so traumatized by having come to that very moment where he was faced with that fundamental question about whether or not to take a step that could result in a thermonuclear exchange that would wipe out millions and millions of people in the Soviet Union and the United States. He was so shocked that he went through a moment of metanoia and, and despite the fact that he'd been a degenerate profligate, in fact, uh, despite all the romanticizing about him, you know, is that he, he, in fact, his father had been a fascist, you know, Joseph Kennedy, he'd been dismissed from the position as being ambassador to New Eng of England because he was supporting and saying positive things about Hitler. Uh, he'd been a bootlegger uh, during the Prohibition era. You know, Kennedy had actually gone uh, in 1939 in his summer vacation from Harvard to Germany and wrote praising things about Hitler. So there had been this expectation that Kennedy was going to play the role. He was going to continue this whole anti-communist activity. In fact, the very first person that he offered a position in his cabinet to was Robert Lovett, who was one of the three guys who, was, who were the trustees of the Anderson Trust. Uh, and so he was, he was playing the game all the way up until that time. He wasn't as virulent about it as they were, as Alan Dulles was, the head of the CIA, who now, uh, not surprisingly, has shown up being the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, now that it's been created as a result of the Lovett Commission recommendations and the recommendations of William D. Pauley, 
uh, both guys that are deeply involved with this Foreign Intelligence Digest network. Uh, that these guys have suggested that look at why not make this official? Why not have a CIA that is actually getting direct funding from the tax monies to do all of these operations to supplement what our private Foreign Intelligence Digest network is having to be doing? Uh, and so what they did is they kept both of those things going. And what happened is when Kennedy was so profoundly shocked by the experience that he had on the night of August 26, or excuse me, October 26 of 1962, that he, he did this, he went through this entire metanoia experience. And what he decided to do is he was going to, he was going to start backing away from this Cold War. This war that had in fact been going on, this covert war had been going on ever since 1917. Uh, the, the October Revolution of 1917, when the Bolsheviks came to power in the Soviet Union. That, that he wanted to bring this war to an end. He said because it, it brought us right to the blink, brink of total thermonuclear holocaust. We can't allow this to happen anymore. He reached out and started having this exchange, private exchange, outside of the authorized channel uh, of, of letters with Nikita Khrushchev. 18 separate private letters in which he was in fact starting to negotiate the disassembly of all of the thermonuclear weapons of the United States in exchange for their agreement to disassemble theirs. This would absolutely destroy the backbone of the American nuclear force uh, in that these men viewed him as a traitor. Uh, they experienced him as a traitor. And they knew from all the information that had been begin being given by, by uh, uh, Jagger Hoover, they knew all about Kennedy. And they knew all about his philandering and his, his bringing prostitutes to the White House and, you know, shacking up with every campaign person he could, you know. Uh, and so they had this attitude about Kennedy that he was a degenerate, that he was a spoiled little brat, that in fact his father, who, you know, basically approached them all, you know, to help get Kennedy elected, you know, that, that Kennedy was betraying them all. And so that these people all decided right from the ground up that this guy had to go. And uh, that, that Jagger Hoover wanted him eliminated, the Joint Chiefs of Staff wanted him eliminated, the FBI uh, people, the SIS people like uh, Sullivan, uh, who were extremely reactionary right-wing people, wanted him eliminated. Uh, there was this whole growing consensus that he had to be eliminated because it wasn't just that they could wait around until he was beaten, possibly in the 1964 presidential election, which was an entire year away at least, what he was doing is he was aggressively hand over fist making negotiations to not only eliminate the nuclear weapons of the country, but he had backdoor channel communication going on to, uh, to Castro that he was going to basically normalize relations with them and allow the, this communist regime to remain right here in the Western Hemisphere. These guys all wanted him gone, but they could not possibly have done this unless they had the authorization from the guys that were really in charge, the people that were in charge of the Anderson Trust, the people that were in Brown Brothers Harriman, in this coven of fascists who actually had constructed the Third Reich as the bulwark against communism in Europe, that these guys had to sign off on this thing. And so Professor uh, Peter Dale Scott is correct in assuming that somebody upstairs who was more powerful than any one of these organizations or even more powerful than the combined organization of the Central Intelligence Agency's Operations Directorate uh, and the Joint Special Operations Agency uh, of, the, of the Pentagon, somebody upstairs had to sign off on this. And what happened is that the Foreign Intelligence Digest Network, this private, shadowy uh, intelligence operation that was going, working for these people in parallel to the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, when Alan Dulles, their consulary, was fired by Kennedy in September of 1962, what they did is they continued to function and they began to pick up the slack and they began to operate to decide how he was going to be killed. And they had access because they could reach through to the people in the operations directorate who agreed with them politically. They could reach through to J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI who agreed with them politically. They could reach through to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Special Operations, the Joint Special Operations Group. They could get at all of these people, not officially, through their official circles, 
but they could get through to them underground because they were, they were netted together. The roots of these people that are beneath the surface, the visible surface, they're bonded together just like redwood trees. You know, they're under the ground, they're netted, their, their roots are bonded together. And so they communicate with each other. That's what happened. And that they, they put together an operation to assassinate the president. They were going to assassinate him in Miami. Uh, if they could, they planned it. Uh, they set up a whole team of people uh, in Fall Guys to take the fall for that. They tried to, they planned to assassinate him in Chicago. Uh, in both times, the warnings were given to the president, so he avoided uh, putting himself in that danger. And then he went to Texas. And so they decided to hit him in Texas. And so what they did, I believe, is they, they had this low-level dangle of, uh, of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, he was, in fact, a, a kind of rabid anti-communist. He was hanging out with rabid anti-communists all the time. And he came to understand that they were getting set, I believe, what they talked him into doing. And this is uh, a bit of a stretch at this point. But I believe that what happened uh, is I believe... I believe that they brought him in on an operation that what he thought was intended simply to fire a shot uh, at, the, at the motorcade so that that could be blamed on the, the communists, could be blamed on the Cubans, and they could basically instigate a major invasion of Cuba by saying that they had shot at the president. And so that, that I think, helps explain that first shot that missed the entire limousine in motorcade by 270 feet. Uh, that was apparently, uh, according to the ballistics on it, uh, that, uh, that that happened, that happened uh, almost eight full seconds prior to the first shot. Uh, that, or prior to the, the first shot they talk about, having hit the president. And so what, what I, I want to do briefly is I want to go, uh, coming from that strategic perspective, of the existence of this particular shadowy network of former military uh, intelligence operatives and the role that, uh, that Lee Harvey Oswald played in it. What I want to do is briefly go over uh, a lot of the questions that, that people are going to have about this, and that is uh, pointing out that the, the critical linchpins between this organization inside Brown Brothers Harriman uh, and Sullivan and Cromwell, and this shadowy network that is the Foreign Intelligence Digest Network, that operation, there were a couple companies that were front organizations for this. One of them was called the World Commerce Corporation, uh, and a subsidiary that it had called the International Commerce Corporation of China. These two front companies were very much like in the off-the-shelf enterprise of Richard Secord and Albert Hakim, in, in uh, Oliver North and Theodore Shackley, they had a major mother corporation that was called the Egyptian American Transport and Service Company, and that the other companies were all subsidiaries of that. They had the same thing going in this enterprise back in, uh, in 1950, 51. They had these companies, these two companies, the World Commerce Corporation and the International, uh, or the Commerce International Corporation, were the actual companies that employed the agents of the Foreign uh, Intelligence Digest, a network. And uh, the, the key players on this, the linchpins between those two organizations, the shadowy group of operatives and the, the wealthy people that called the shots, were General Charles Willoughby, as I mentioned, uh, General Edward Lansdale, who was the field operative for the Anderson Trust, uh, because he's the one that had found the gold and treasure and had turned it over to them. Uh, and uh, William D. Pauley, that I've mentioned before, and a fellow by the name of Rip Robertson, William Rip Robertson, who you will see here, I dare say for the first time, uh, tipping his hat to the president uh, 1.2 seconds before the president was shot, standing on the curb in Dealey Plaza, tipping his hat to him. This is the head of the S-Force. This is the field commander for the assassins that were trained to kill Fidel Castro. This is the man that was standing in Dealey Plaza, tipping his hat goodbye to the president uh, before the shot rang out. And this is Grayson Lynch standing next to him, his cohort. It's very well known. And all you have to do is know people 
who know these guys to be able to identify who they were. And nobody seems to realize who they were. But we do know who they were because I know the people that know these people. Okay? And so that this is, that William Rip Robertson is one of the key elements uh, in this understanding of who these people were and what they did. And it's important to know before we start on the individual shots uh, in Who Struck John in, the, in Dealey Plaza that you understand that there was a meeting that took place at 11.55 midnight on the night of November 21st of 1963 in, in Dallas at the home of Clint Murchison Jr. And Clint Murchison Jr. is the one who owned the Oaxaca Ranch down in Mexico where the triangular fire team training of the S Force took place. There was a meeting took place in Dallas, Texas uh, on the night before the president was killed at 11.55 at night. It lasted 20 minutes. And uh, at that meeting in Dallas at Clint Murchison's house were Alan Dulles, Edward Lansdale, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, George H.W. Bush, and J. Edgar Hoover were all there in that meeting that night at Clint Murchison's house at 11.55 at night for 20 minutes. And they all went their own way. Uh, and uh, a number of them are the only people who had ever asked that couldn't remember where they were when the president was killed. Okay? Uh, now, of, of the 33 specific facts that we need to know about that build this, this uh, conclusion. Uh, number 30 and 31 are the key ones and that what is the evidence as to who the ultimate authors of the assassination were and what was the relationship between Lee Harvey Oswald and these people. So what I want to do is, is quickly before we uh, break, what time, what time are we supposed to break? At 30 minutes from now. 30 minutes from now, okay. That, uh, let me just take it slowly here. Number one, as I've said, Lee Harvey Oswald, number one, Lee Harvey Oswald was not some simple, deranged, lone nut or Marxist communist. He was, as I pointed out, a former low-level military intelligence operative working for Operation Redskin, who in fact was recruited and hired to work for the Foreign Intelligence Digest Network. We actually have a letter that was written by Lee Harvey Oswald to H.L. Hunt, uh, asking him to clarify what his employment relationship was with him, that he wanted to know exactly what the details of his relationship were. Uh, number two, very importantly, Lee Harvey Oswald uh, could not have inflicted the degree or the specific nature of damage that the president suffered from the gunshot wounds that he experienced in Dealey Plaza on that day. He could not have done this from the alleged sixth story window of the school book depository. Uh, and we'll discuss that in some detail. Number three, and very critically, Governor John Connolly was not shot by the same bullet that hit the president uh, in the neck. That that did not happen. That, uh, that it's, it's absolutely clear uh, from the Zapruder film and from the testimony of John Connolly, that that entire thing is a fiction, that he is absolutely positive, as he's related in detail to Dick Billings, who's the co-author with me on the book, that he's positive that he was not hit by that bullet, because he heard the shot, he turned to his right, and saw the president grasping his throat, and he started to turn back to his left to say something, and, and he was hit with a separate shot. So that means that there were four shots that were fired because there's the first shot that was fired, which we'll go over, that missed the entire limousine by 270 feet. Uh, there's the second shot that hit the president in the throat. There's the third shot that hit John Connolly. And there's the fourth shot that hit the president and killed him. Uh, and there's no possible way that four shots like that could have been fired in that amount of time. Not just the three shots that people know can't happen, but four shots could never have happened. Okay, uh, and so that that uh, in, in the fact of the matter is that that shot that uh, hit the president, uh, the the second shot 
uh, we'll talk about uh, in, in some detail. But uh, the, the, this first shot that missed everything uh, happened at approximately uh, Zapruder film frame 158. Uh, uh, in the, this, this, this missed everything, okay? And the, that, it hit the curb, uh, the, the, the chips of uh, concrete flew and hit Jack Teague in the face. Several witnesses saw this, heard the shot, saw the, the debris fly, saw the, him get hit in the face with the debris. That particular chunk of this curb has been taken and analyzed, and there's lead bullet uh, remnants on the curb. Uh, so they, they know that that happened. Uh, and so that the first shot that missed entirely had to have either been intentionally missed by anyone firing from above and behind to miss the entire limousine by 270 feet. Uh, or it had to have been fired from the front and to the right and missed the president going by and thereby was able to hit 270 feet away uh, without the person being blind who was doing the firing. Okay. And uh, so that the, uh, the throat shot, the throat shot had to have come from the front. Now, all the Parkland Hospital uh, personnel talked about it being a pencil-wide uh, hole in his throat. It was clear of an entrance wound. Uh, and it was impossible for that, just below his Adam's apple, it was impossible for a shot to have been fired from above and behind, coming down from a 45 to 60 degree angle, and hit the president, even if, in fact, it was only three inches below his collar, instead of the full six inches below his collar that all the, the Parkland Hospital facility people all testified it was. Uh, even if it was three inches below his collar, you can't have a bullet coming down at a 45 to 60 degree angle, hit him three inches below the collar, and come out under his Adam's apple. That isn't going to happen. Okay? So he was hit from the front uh, with, that, with that second shot. And uh, that means that there had to be another gunman. Because uh, even if one argues that Lee Harvey Oswald was in the school book depository, which we know he was because he was witnessed there by both Truly and Officer Baker within at least a minute or two, uh, and he could never have gotten from the grassy knoll to there. Okay, so we know that there was a second gunman. So that means that it's it's clear that there was a second shooter. So we know that there was some type of conspiracy that was going on uh, that that uh, resulted in this. Now, uh, second, the number eight fact is that all of the Parkland Hospital staff. They all talked about, as I said, number one, this shot being, a, in the throat shot being a, a shot from the front. Secondly, they all testified in detail about the fact that the president had a bullet hole in his right forehead, just above his right eye, in his temple, and that the whole back right side of his entire skull was blown out. Uh, in fact, that his brains were hanging out of the back of his head uh, through that. Uh, and, and they wrote it up there. They actually have photographs of it. Okay? Uh, and, the, the, and the fact that the, the police officers who were to the left and behind him were hit with the flying brain matter uh, and the chunk of his skull went out across the back of the limousine that Jackie was climbing after. That, uh, and uh, the Zapruder film uh, of, of uh, frame 313 that shows him famously being hit and falling backwards and to the left. You know, backwards and to the left, over and over again. Uh, it's, it's absolutely clear from all of the evidence at the Parkland Hospital uh, that, in fact, the, the shot that hit the president and killed him came from the front and to the right of him and entered the, uh, just above his, his eye, right eye and the forehead, and blew out the back of his head. Now, uh, very importantly, now, the extremely importantly, is that there are photographs purported photographs that have been set forth as the official <coughs> photographs taken at the Bethesda autopsy that show the president's, the, uh, purportedly the back of the president's head completely intact with just a tiny pencil sized uh, uh, bullet hole in the lower left side of his skull. Okay, And this is totally contradictory to all of the information from the people at the Parkland Hospital that could not conceivably have been missed. Okay, and photographs that were taken there. And so that we know positively that there is an active conspiracy going on to conceal and falsify evidence. Because we know from the photographs that have been submitted as the official autopsy report is completely false. 
And so that does a very important thing. What that does is it causes an entire necessary shift in worldview from that which we, most of us, had back in November of 1963, where we generally assumed that what our government was telling us was true. Okay? Because now we know that it wasn't. And we know that there was active concealment and fabrication of evidence. And so that that shifts the entire worldview as to exactly what we're dealing with. And that becomes crucial. Okay? Uh, now, so if shot one either missed so far from the limousine that it had to have been fired uh, to intentionally miss, or in fact it was fired from the right, uh, either one of those things makes it absolutely clear that there was in fact another gunman, as I said. So that we've not only got the falsification of the evidence, but we've got another gunman uh, shooting in the square. And it's clear that whoever the other gunman was, it wasn't Lee Harvey Oswald because he was in the book depository. So we now have a 99% probability uh, uh, that in fact there was another gunman that was, that was shooting at the president. And so that there are a couple things we need to check now. We have to check about what about any of these other shots? Is it possible that Lee Harvey Oswald fired one of these shots? We got the first shot that missed the limousine by 270 feet. We got the second shot hitting the president in the throat coming from the front. Okay, and it's clear that from the, the bullet hole exiting, even if it's only three inches below his collar, that in fact could happen. If he got hit in the front with a hard with a hard case bullet in the below the Adam's apple, it could have come out three inches below his his collar. That is explainable. Now, okay, so the, the question is, what about this third shot, the one that hit Connolly? It's perfectly clear that Connolly was hit from above and behind. The bullet entered his right lower with his right shoulder, came out below his right nipple, broke his, uh, his right uh, wrist, and then reflected into his left uh, calf or thigh. Okay? So that, that one clearly came from above at approximately 40 to 60 degrees uh, angle down. So there's a third shot that has taken place now. It appears that the first two shots both came from the knoll. That the one that missed and went 270 feet uh, away and hit the curb, the second one that hit him in the throat, uh, and, the, uh, and then there's a third shot that hit Conley. So somebody is firing from above and behind uh, who, hit, who hit Conley. And so the, the question is, who was that? Uh, and uh, was, was that, was that uh, our friend Lee Harvey Oswald? And did Lee Harvey Oswald think that he was involved in some kind of an operation where he was supposed to just shoot at the president, miss by 270 feet, generate a huge brouhaha, and blame it on Castro? And if that's true, then who fired the other shot that hit Connolly? And the answer to that would be almost certainly James Braden uh, from the Daltex building. Uh, who was arrested uh, coming out of the Daltex Dal building, uh, owned by H.L. Hunt. Uh, and that uh, he was in fact stopped and questioned, had no good excuse for what he was doing there, provided a false name. Uh, uh, it, it turns out that his, that his uh, actual name is Eugene Hale Brading. And he was also picked up outside of the hotel in Los Angeles on June 5th of 1968, right after the, kid, the shooting of Bobby Kennedy. Uh, he was picked up in both places, okay? Uh, and, that, uh, and the firing from the Daltex building would have had the exact angle uh, at which Connolly was clearly hit, okay? Uh, now, shot the, the, uh, so the, 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 time, the timing on these shots is extremely important because it becomes absolutely clear that it's impossible uh, to, for one gunman to be firing these shots, even within the time sequence. To say nothing about the angles and the size of the bullet holes and entries, the fact of the matter is nobody can fire uh, four shots uh, with a man liquor Carcano rifle, bolt action, in that amount of time. The, the minimal amount of time was 5.6 seconds. The maximum amount of time was 8.4 seconds. Uh, the debate only goes on in that range. 
But the fact of the matter is nobody can shoot four shots in that time. They even tried to get three shots fired by all of the experts, and what they had to do is they had to bolt down, they had to bolt down the rifle onto a, a, a base, uh, and then, then crank, the, crank the bolt as fast as they could and fire it in order to get it in under 8.4 seconds. And it didn't leave any time for aiming at all. Okay? Uh, and yeah, so they wanted to go around saying, well, you know, it was. They, they were able to fire three shots. Yeah, but that doesn't mean they could fire four shots. And that's what the challenge is that they have. Okay? Uh, so the, so we, we, come, we come back to the, this, uh, this question uh, about the, uh, there's, a, there's another major fact that we haven't talked about yet, and it bears a lot of examination. Uh, and that is, the fact is, that the original photographs of the so-called three uh, expended shells below the window in the, the sixth floor of the book depository, as it turns out, the original photograph shows that only two of them have actually been expended. The other is an unfired bullet. Okay? Really? It, really. Okay? And in fact, there are several photographs of this. Uh, and yet, all of a sudden, it all disappeared, and they all ended up being three uh, empty cartridges, uh, or shell casings, all of which they say bears the, the, the pin strike of the firing pin of the Manlicker Kakano. Turns out, the third of the bullets isn't even a Manlicker Kakano bullet. Okay? That's an important issue to deal with. All right. Uh, now, the the other uh, other issues that that uh, if in fact uh, we we have to we have to come to this question again of of, of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald of whether or not he was the kind of person that could in fact participate in something that was only shooting at somebody to try to generate some false impression. And what we know, he's specifically already accused of having shot at uh, General Edwin Walker uh, back in April. And the fact of the matter is, is that, that if a person can't hit General Walker <laughs> sitting still at his breakfast table through a window, they aren't going to be able to put two shots inside a six-inch circle and kill the president in a moving vehicle. Okay? Uh, yeah, but we know that there was this whole... Uh, issue going on about allegedly uh, someone shooting at Edwin Walker. Well, it turns out that Edwin Walker is a major participant in the Foreign Intelligence Digest Network. He, in fact, is an intimate of that group. In fact, uh, the, uh, the, he, he actually issued an extremely interesting uh, statement uh, shortly before the, the killing. He asserted that the American people ought to rise up and engage in violent uh, uh, vocal protest uh, against the United States government uh, because there was a conspiracy going on inside the United States of people who were communists who were opposed to our, uh, our government uh, and that they were all inside the government, inside the Kennedy administration. Uh, and so this is the, the Edward, Edward Walker who had been fired by President Kennedy, in fact, for uh, propagandizing his military forces, passing out John Birch literature, John Birch Society literature, which in fact was characterized as fascist in its nature. Uh, and that, that this, was being, uh, this was being allowed to go on by the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, by uh, Lemonser. Uh, they were all authorizing this to go on because you need to understand that during this period of time there was this huge thing going on in the country where, uh, where McCarthy, where, uh, where Senator uh, Joseph Mark McCarthy and Senator Eastland in the Senate were engaged in this House Un-American Activities Committee uh, hearings <coughs> and the, the uh, Domestic Security Committee that they were having, the Internal Security Committee. And everybody was on this huge anti-communist bandwagon. And the, this whole thing was going on uh, while, while this was happening. And Lee Harvey Oswald, who in fact was already a low-level to mid-level operative uh, of the military intelligence thing, could have been swept up into this type of activity uh, to be potentially able to engage in an operation where he might be willing to fire a shot in the direction of the motorcade, 
anticipating that in fact that's all that was going to happen. But that in fact, as soon as that first shot was fired, it ended up being a signal that other people that he didn't even need to know about were in place to actually carry out the assassination of the president. Because it's clear that Lee Harvey Oswald uh, was being set up. That there were two, at least two, false Oswalds going around, shooting at various firing ranges and going, oh, my name is Lee Harvey Oswald and I'm shooting at your target. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm just being a completely irascible jerk. But my name is Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, uh, you know, in, 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 here's my man liquor Carcano rifle. You know, it's clear that this kind of thing was going on all around him. Uh, and that it's absolutely clear that it wasn't he because they know where he was. Uh, with, with multiple witnesses, he wasn't there at those places. So that, that there, there was, in fact, this, uh, this operation going on to set him up, uh, in addition to the possibility that given the fact that he was part of this particular network, this foreign intelligence uh, digest network, and uh, hanging out with virulent anti-communists who hated Kennedy, <coughs> that he was perfectly willing to facilitate and participate in some kind of an endeavor to have a shot fired at the presidential limousine, but far enough away that he wasn't going to hit anybody. So that is, that is a possibility, because it's important to remember that, that Lee Harvey Oswald is not the person that people are professing him to be. He, in fact, is a, is a consistent, right-wing, anti-communist, uh, low-level, active operative. Of, of military intelligence uh, and then working for these other people at the time. So the, that is, the, uh, that is the, the data that we, that we need to, to have in mind. And so the, the question, the question that, that comes up is that if in fact such an organization existed, if in fact this cabal, uh, referred to by Winston Churchill actually, as the high cabal, that actually governs in the United States. Uh, these people in Brown Brothers Harem, uh, who are represented by Alan Dulles uh, and, and uh, John Foster Dulles, uh, in fact, are the ones that killed the president. And they had this, and still have this, at that time, $1.2 trillion uh, secret fund, which is secretly administered to promote and foster uh, authoritarian fascist policy uh, around the world and that they actually used the funds to install numerous fascists around the world. What are the implications of that? And I should close in this uh, particular uh, section that we have before we start our discussion and just to, to, to remind you that it was in fact uh, the Mexico City station of the CIA back in 1973 when Theodore Shackley was made the head of Western Hemisphere operations for the CIA. Theodore Shackley, who was the understudy to Reinhard Galen, who, for 20, who between 1948 uh, and 1961 was the deputy to Reinhard Galen in Germany, when in fact he became the head of Western Hemisphere operations and removed everybody from the uh, station chief positions in the Western Hemisphere and replaced the CIA station chief in Mexico City with Tom Polgar. And that Polgar directly told Joseph Burkholder Smith, the, the deputy station chief in Mexico City in 1973, that he had to answer questions of a particular group of people that were going to be asking him questions, the answers to which would depend upon whether or not he was going to be made the new station chief, left on as the deputy station chief. And we remember, he told me directly, in the presence of Dick Billings, the, the chief staff writer for the House Select Committee on Assassinations, that he was sent to meet, he, that Nasser Haro came to meet him that next morning at 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, and brought him, flew him, all the way to Buenos Aires uh, uh, in, uh, in Argentina, and then took him up to Salta and walked him in to this Bavarian Inn where the six Nazi guys were sitting there with a swastika flag above the, the mantelpiece. And they told him 
that in order for him to be left on as the deputy CIA station chief in Mexico City, he would have to promise them that he would not interfere with their Colombian Medellin cocaine cartel, uh, which the funds from which were going to be used to finance the war without boundaries against your enemies and ours. What I've said is, what does that mean? What that means is that there is a direct alliance going on between self-conscious World War II fascists who have escaped from Germany and come into South America and are operating there, running a thing called Operation Condor, uh, that in fact was a massive assassination program directed against school teachers and uh, labor organizers and students and others all around uh, South America that were opposing the fascist dictators who were being installed in those governments by the funds that were available through the Anderson Trust. And that, uh, that he had to promise not to interfere <laughs> with this as a condition for him being left in office. And he told us that if we were going to be investigating these guys, you have to ultimately know who you're dealing with. And that's the explanation for what happened to the president. Uh, and that's the discussion that we want to have uh, after the break to understand what the implications of this are uh, for us still in this particular day uh, where we see going on in the world what we see going on. Because when the Soviet Union dissolved, you'll remember, on December 31st of, uh, of 19... Uh, of, of, of 1991, actually, that you remember what happened is the staff of Dick Cheney, who was the Secretary of Defense under President George Herbert Walker Bush, that Dick Cheney, uh, and the guys went into the West Wing uh, with Paul Wolfowitz and, uh, and Scooter Libby and David Addington uh, and, uh, and uh, Abrams, uh, Elliot Abrams, and they drafted up the 1992 United States Defense Department policy planning guidance document saying, oh look, now that the Soviet Union is finally gone from 1917 <coughs> all the way up until December 31st of 1991, now that they're gone, what we want to do is we want to establish the doctrine of full spectrum dominance to be able to establish complete control over every inch of the planet and to take control of this. And the second iteration of that particular document said specifically, the purpose of this is to maintain the continued privileged access to the strategic raw materials that are needed by members of the Northern Industrial Alliance. And that the Northern Industrial Alliance was intended to include the United States, Canada, Mexico, not under the control of the indigenous Mexicans, but the Castilian Spanish in the pre that ran that political party, and the United Kingdom, and France, and, the, and Spain, and Italy, and the new reunified Germany. And they specifically recommended at the suggestion of Theodore G. Shackley, who was the director of covert operations for the Central Intelligence Agency worldwide under George Herbert Walker Bush, they specifically said that they wanted to invite Russia to now join this alliance now that they had spun off all of their ethnic provinces. You are dealing with a self-conscious, Caucasian, fascist element inside our country that in fact resides in those seats of power in Brown Brothers Harriman represented by Sullivan and Cromwell, who in fact are in control of the major policies of the United States. And that something has to be done to deal with these people. We'll have a discussion about this in the next 15 minutes.